Hello. Welcome back. It's so good to see you. So today is another true crime video day. Yay. Um, and today's video is going to be about Richard Ramirez, aka the Night Stalker. Now, I know that Richard Ramirez is quite famous, but I did not know who he was until recently. And I know who he is now, and his story is intense. So, let's get started. Okay, um, so Richard Ramirez was born on February 29th, 1960. So I guess that was a leap year. Uh, in El Paso, Texas, and he was the youngest of five children. Now, Richard's family was originally from Juarez, Mexico, where his father worked as a police officer. Richard's father ended up moving to Santa Fe to work on a railroad, relocating the whole family to Texas before Richard was born. Now, Richard's father, on one hand, was a very hardworking and very determined man. He wanted to be able to provide for his family. But on the other hand, um, he was prone to bursts of anger and often physically abusing his wife and children. So this created a very toxic home environment for Richard, having such an angry father. Um, at the age of two, Richard climbed on top of a dresser to get something causing it to fall over on top of him, leaving a large gash in his forehead. Three years later, at the age of five, while at school, Richard was again hit in the head with a swing, resulting in him being knocked unconscious. Yikes. From that point on, Richard suffered from seizures. Growing up, Richard would spend a lot of his time nearby at his cousin's home. Richard's cousin, Miguel, was much older, and he was a Green Beret combat veteran who served in the Vietnam War. Now, with that being said, his cousin was pretty messed up, as a lot of Vietnam veterans were. Um, but to Richard, Miguel was a pretty cool cousin, so Richard spent a lot of time at his cousin's house. Well, Miguel would tell Richard all the awful things that he had experienced or done while being stationed in Vietnam. Stories such as Miguel raping women. Um, Miguel even showed Richard photos of himself posing with a severed head belonging to a woman that he had raped and killed. At the time, Richard was only 10 years old, so he was very young and impressionable. Having his cool cousin show him these things perhaps instilled in Richard that these things were cool. I don't know. Miguel actually taught Richard some skills he had learned in the military, including how to capture and kill people. On May 4th, 1973, Richard was at Miguel's home when Miguel and his wife got into a very heated argument. Something happened during this argument that pushed Miguel over the edge, and Miguel ended up shooting his wife in the face, killing her. So, Richard witnessed Miguel murder his wife. Miguel was arrested, but was found not guilty by reasons of insanity, and they sentenced him to a state mental facility, releasing him after just four years. After the shooting, Richard decided to move in with his sister and her husband, Roberto. Now, his sister's husband was a peeping Tom. Gross. 
and Roberto, 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 I don't know how you say that name, <laughs> Roberto would take Richard along with him at night to peep into neighbors' windows and watch them. Somehow, as a teenager, Richard started associating his sexual fantasies with violence. By this time, Richard was in high school and also began working part-time at a hotel. He began using this job to his advantage. He would use his passkey to enter the hotel rooms and rob the guests while they were away. One night, while Richard was working, he used his key pass to break into a guest's room, a couple who was from out of state. Now at that time, the husband was not in the room. So when Richard, when Richard entered this room, the woman was alone. Finding the woman, Richard attempted to rape her. And during this act, her husband walked in and began attacking Richard. The police were called and Richard was arrested. Unfortunately, the charges against Richard were dropped when the couple refused to testify. Now, the couple lived in another state and did not want to travel back to testify against him. But because of this incident, Richard did lose his job at the hotel, which, thank goodness. After this, Richard made the decision to drop out of school in the ninth grade. Some time passes, and at the age of 22, Richard decided to move from Texas to California. On April 10th, 1984, Richard was staying at a hotel in San Francisco, and he murdered a nine-year-old girl in the basement of that hotel. He raped and beat the girl before stabbing her to death. This is the first known killing that Richard committed Initially, it wasn't connected to him. It remained unsolved for many, many years, and it wasn't until 2009 that they were able to link Richard's DNA to the horrible murder. After this event, Richard moved to Los Angeles. On June 28, 1984, a 79-year-old woman named Jenny was found murdered in her apartment in Los Angeles. It was said that she had been stabbed repeatedly while she was asleep and her throat was cut so deeply that she was nearly decapitated. Police determined that Richard entered her residence through a window because they found shoe prints, but they had no suspects at that time. On March 17, 1985, Richard attacked a 22-year-old woman named Maria. Maria was returning home and pulled into her driveway. She got out of her car to open the garage door. At that time, she sees Richard inside her garage. This surprised Richard, and he ran up to Maria, pulled out his gun, and shot her in the face. She ended up surviving the attack because when Richard pulled out his gun, she had put her hands over her face, and the bullet ricocheted off the keys that were in her hand. Richard thought she was dead, so he entered the home. Maria's 34-year-old roommate, Dale, was inside. She had heard the gunshot from inside the home and ducked behind a counter in the kitchen to hide. I can't get my pages to turn. Sorry. <laughs> okay. After some time, Dale raised her head over the counter to look around. Richard sees her, shoots her in the face, killing her instantly. He then ate half of a banana while walking around the house looking for any valuables in the home and then just left. Less than an hour later, Richard came across a woman named Veronica who was sitting in her car. Richard wanted to steal her car so that he could get away. So he pulled Veronica out of her vehicle, shoots her twice, and then ran away, 
leaving the car behind. What? A few weeks later, on March 27th, Richard broke into a home and sees 64-year-old Vincent sleeping next to his wife, 44-year-old Maxine. Richard shoots Vincent in the head. This awakens his wife. Richard then jumps onto Maxine and began to beat her. He then ties her hands together and demands that she tell him where the valuables are. Maxine pointed to some of her jewelry and told him that he could take whatever he wanted. Richard then continues going through the house, leaving Maxine in the bedroom. Maxine was able to get out of the hand ties and remembered that there was a shotgun under the bed. So she pulled the gun out and just then Richard returns to the room. Maxine points the gun at him and pulls the trigger. Nothing happened because unfortunately the gun wasn't loaded. This enrages Richard, so he shoots her three times. Then Richard goes to the kitchen to grab a knife, goes back to the bedroom, and cuts both of Maxine's eyes out. Then places the eyes in a jewelry box and takes them with him. Ugh. Richard then leaves the home unaware that he, again, left his shoe prints behind outside the home. Later, the police went out to this home and photographed the shoe prints and made a cast of the prints as well. They also found bullets at the scene, which matched bullets at previous attack locations. At that moment, the police realized that they are dealing with a serial killer. On May 14, 1985, Richard broke into the home of 66-year-old Bill and his 56-year-old wife, Lillian. When Richard entered the home, Bill was in his bedroom and the two have a confrontation. Bill reached for his own gun and Richard shot him in the face. Then Richard goes around the home looking for things to take and he enters Lillian's room. He ties her up rapes her, then continues ransacking the home and leaves. On May 29th, Richard steals another car, drives out to the home where 83-year-old Mabel and her 81-year-old sister Florence live. Richard breaks into their home, goes into the kitchen where he sees a hammer. He then sees Florence and begins to beat her with the hammer. Then he runs into Mabel ties her wrists together and proceeds to beat her as well. For some reason, Richard locates some electrical cords and gives both of the women electrical shocks with the cords. He then rapes Florence. After that, he finds some lipstick and draws a pentagram on Mabel's thigh as well as on the wall in the bedroom. The women were found two days later and were still alive. They were both taken to the hospital to recover. On July 2nd, Richard stole another vehicle and then broke into the home of 75-year-old Mary where she was sleeping in her bed. He grabbed a lamp and beat Mary to death, searched the home for valuables, and left. On July 7th, 1985, Richard, shock, broke into another home. 61-year-old Joyce was sleeping on her couch. Richard then beat her to death and at one point he even stomped on her face, leaving a very clear shoe print on her face. Then Richard goes to the store and purchases a machete. Richard then steals another car, drives out to the home of 66-year-old Layla and her 68-year-old husband Max. Richard enters their bedroom while they were sleeping, kills both of them with the machete, then shoots them both in the head, then robs their house. That same night, July 20th at 4 a.m., Richard breaks into another home, kills the husband, ties up, and rapes the wife. Then the couple's eight-year-old son hears the noise and walks into his parents' room. Richard then ties the eight-year-old boy up 
and then drags the boy around the house demanding that the boy show him where the valuables were. At this time, Richard then forces the boy to swear to Satan that he was not hiding any money from him. Then Richard left and the boy was able to run to a neighbor's for help. August 8th, 1985, Richard steals, steals another car and broke into the home of 27-year-old Sakina and her husband, 31-year-old Elias. While the couple was sleeping, Richard shoots and kills Elias, then handcuffed Sakina and has her show him where her jewelry was. Then she, then he tells her to swear on Satan that she would not scream while he assaulted her. Then he just leaves. So during all this, the police were linking all the victims together, but they didn't want to release any information to the public as not to draw attention, you know, letting the serial killer know what they knew. Um, then out of nowhere, there was a televised press conference to let the public know what was happening to, you know, warn them to be safe, lock their doors and windows, that kind of thing. During this conference is where they gave Richard the name the Night Stalker. This media press conference was given without notice to the LA detectives working on the case, which made them very angry because they didn't want this Night Stalker to know that they were on to him. Well, Richard did see this media press conference and found out that his shoes were linking him to all the crimes. So he took his shoes to San Francisco and threw them off the Golden Gate Bridge. Um, Richard stays in San Francisco for a few days and then travels back to Los Angeles. On August 24th, 1985, Richard again wants to break into a home. He finds a house and is just kind of lurking outside. Well, inside, there's a 13-year-old boy named James, and he heard footsteps outside of his window. Now, by this time, the fear of the Night Stalker has been instilled in everyone. So naturally the boy thinks, ah, it's the Night Stalker, and he runs to go wake up his parents. So they all wake up and start making a lot of noise to let whoever is out there think that there is a lot of people inside the home. Well, it worked because it freaked Richard out and he gets into a stolen car to escape. At the same time, James, the 13-year-old, runs outside with a notepad and he wrote down the color, the make and model of the car and was even able to write down a partial plate number before Richard sped off. The boy then gave the information to the police. Four days later, police were able to locate the vehicle. Richard was gone by the time the police found the vehicle, um, but they did find a fingerprint on the back of a rearview mirror. So now they were finally able to put a name and a face to the Night Stalker, Richard Ramirez. Finally, law enforcement decided to release to the media a mugshot of Richard that they had on file from a previous arrest. During this press conference, they showed Richard's mugshot and released his name. They knew that Richard was watching and basically said, we know who you are and now everyone else does, so we're gonna get you. On August 30th, Richard decides to take a bus to Tucson, Arizona, where his brother lived. Somewhere along the way, he decides not to hide out at his brother's, and he takes another bus, another bus back to Los Angeles. Richard arrived in Los Angeles on August 31st. As he was getting off the bus, he sees a news rack outside of a store, and on every single newspaper, his picture was on the cover. 
he sees this and then people around him see it and they start to recognize him so obviously he freaks out and just starts running he tried to run across a freeway he stopped a car and tried to steal this woman's car um, other people had slowed down around this to see what was happening and they actually stopped him from carjacking this woman Richard then just flees the scene hoping hopping several fences then he attempted two more carjackings attempted now Richard had ended up in a very rough part of town in East Los Angeles so as he tried to stop a car to steal it a group of guys on the street saw this and were like no way not in our neighborhood and then this group of guys just start attacking Richard one guy actually hit him over the head with a metal bar preventing him from getting away then they just continually beat Richard until the police came so finally Richard was arrested and off of the streets. At Richard's first court appearance, he had carved a pentagram onto his hand and made a big show of it to the cameras in the courtroom and yelled, Hail Satan. On August 3rd, 1988, there were rumors that Richard was going to shoot the prosecutioner with a gun that he was somehow going to snuggle, smuggle into the courtroom. So they installed a metal detector to prevent that. On August 14th, 1988, Richard's trial was temporarily interrupted because one of the jurors was found dead from a gunshot wound in her apartment. So everyone else on the jury became terrified because they believed that this was Richard's doing. Later, it was determined that Richard had nothing to do with that juror's death, and it was actually her boyfriend that had shot and killed her. Like, what was going on in this town? Crazy. Um, so they needed to bring in a replacement juror. Well, by this time, the media was heavily heavily covering the case and pictures of Richard from in the courtroom and you know his life or whatever were everywhere and a lot of women thought that Richard was a very good looking guy and he began to get fans um, Richard was getting hundreds of letters from women who were just in love with him and people who just knew he had to be innocent he was just too cute what? So they did find a replacement, um, a replacement juror, a woman named Cindy. Now what they didn't know was that Cindy was a fangirl of Richard's. She was infatuated with Richard, just in love to no ends with him. So she would smile and kind of flirt with Richard when she saw him in the courtroom. Cindy even wrote him notes and letters during the trial. Now, Richard thought that this was great. If he could hook this woman, Cindy, he would have some sway, possibly, and maybe get like a hung jury. Well, it didn't work, because on September 30th, 1989, Richard was convicted of all charges. 13 counts of murder, five attempted murders, 11 sexual assaults, and 14 burglaries. Richard was sentenced to death in California's gas chambers. Ugh, that's gotta be the worst death sentence. Ugh. While in prison, Richard actually proposed to one of his fangirls named Doreen. They actually got married on October 3rd, 1996 in the California San Quentin State Prison. Doreen eventually left and divorced Richard because they had linked Richard to the rape and murder of the nine-year-old girl in the hotel basement. And apparently that was just too upsetting for her to deal with. Not that any of the other crimes that he did, those weren't upsetting. 
this one was upsetting. <laughs> what? Uh, while Richard was waiting for his execution date, he started to become very ill and his health declined pretty rapidly and he ended up passing away at the age of 53 on June 7th, 2013 from B-cell lymphoma and I looked that up and I think it's like a, a type of blood cancer, something like that. Um, okay, so I didn't include every detail because some things were just too disturbing. Um, but there is a documentary about him on Netflix. Very, very good. I think it's called The Night Stalker or something like that. Very good, but very disturbing. Um, yeah, this story was very intense and very sad and very scary, but I mean, that, that was the story of Richard Ramirez, the Night Stalker. So, yeah. Um, if you guys have any suggestions for any other videos, true crime, that you want me to cover, just let me know in the comments. I'd really like to hear some suggestions. Um, I love this series. I don't know what to call it. I just, because, like, I find out about so many different stories that I would have never known. Very interesting. But anyway, I hope that you enjoyed that. Thank you so much for watching, and I will see you soon.